Patrick, the understanding of religious belief is something that I, uh, I, I'm very fascinated by. I see in myself uh, sometimes religious beliefs, sometimes completely naturalistic scientific beliefs, and I certainly see in my friends very strong examples of both. And when I see that, I take a step back and I say, well, why do we believe the things we do? And, and, and try to investigate belief systems, and there are different mm -hmm. approaches. So, as a neuropsychologist, mm -hmm. can you look at some examples uh, in the literature, or in the research, of belief systems so we can begin to understand something more than just philosophy about it? Hmm. Yeah, I think there are. There are lots of clinical syndromes that involve dramatic changes in belief systems. Um, and uh, I think one common denominator in them all is that beliefs start with the identif identification of something that's salient to the individual. You know, so and that and that requires the dopamine system to tag some event or person as salient. The dopamine system being a neurotransmitter that's projected up into the higher cortical systems that support various neural networks. Right, so of, of the different uh, chemical transmitters in the brain, this is one of the important ones, obviously. Right, and it's particularly important for the identification of what's important. Okay. Okay, so now something's tagged as important. Now it gets funneled into the processing systems. We, I had a case of Othello syndrome where... Othello, as in Shakespeare's uh, Othello. Right, <laughs> involving delusional and obsessional jealousy where we um, gave a dopaminergic agent to this individual for therapeutic reasons. It uh, up the dopamine stores, dopamine activity in the brain, and he developed a very um, insulated delusional belief system about his wife, that she was cheating on him. And that belief system, so it's, the dopamine gets activated. He tags this issue, what's my wife doing, is salient to him. He develops a delusion about it. And then the delusion is insulated from evidence to the contrary. So there's, no matter what evidence we presented to him that his wife was not cheating on him, it, he would not be convinced. And he used all kinds of silly little stimuli like headlights in the driveway or stains on a bed or something like missing money or something like that as evidence that his wife was indeed treating So in this belief system, the person would only look for corroboratory evidence exactly. no matter how bizarre and erroneous the belief was, the only evidence they would do that consider is evidence that supported the, the wrong belief. Right, and all evidence to the contrary was not seen, not heard, could not be assimilated. It wasn't that he didn't want to assimilate it. He could not do so. He was not noticing evidence to the contrary. So, so the brain puts constraint, constraints on our belief processing systems at least for some highly fitness relevant functions like being jealous of your mate or you know what your mate is doing and that's so these sort of primary fitness indicators are subject to very severe constraints by the brain mm. are there other examples um, another fascinating example for me is called capra syndrome and here the patient usually has lesions in the frontal lobe and, but the lesion is situated in such a way that front, some frontal functions continue, but they're disconnected from temporal lobe functions and memory functions. So the primary sy symptom is that the patient believes that somebody very familiar to him, his wife usually, is an imposter. She looks just like, if you say, well, how come she looks like your wife? Well, she looks just like her, I know. She has the same voice, wears the same clothes, but I know she's not my wife. You somehow created an imposter. How would we do that? <laughs> I don't know. You scientists, you somehow did it. You found somebody who looks like her. I don't know why you're doing it, but she's not my wife. And no evidence will convince him otherwise. Again, the insulation of the delusional belief system from counter evidence. Uh, are there examples of that, that that's not wife? Is there other kinds of imposters? Or is it, is it, is it? It's usually somebody very familiar because the mechanism depends on not being able to access memory stores adequately. See, the disconnection between the frontal system, the judgment system, and memories about the wife or the familiar person, they're not being integrated. 
So he confabulates a story as to why, okay, I see somebody who looks like my wife, but somehow she's not my wife. And he gets that feeling because he can't access memories about the wife adequately. So he has to confabulate a story as to why he can't do that. He confabulates the story that it's an imposter. Be because what he sees, it doesn't, he's not able to compare with his memory of it because right. there's been an interruption. There's a disconnection. He can't access memory stores about familiar figures. And that tells us that memory stores about familiar figures are likely organized in separate components than other memory stores. Mm, mm. You know, they can, they can be accessed separately and they can be distorted separately and they feed into delusional systems. So, so clearly, belief systems are related to the biology of the brain. We see these examples where it goes wrong. Um, so let's try to think now, what does that mean for when things don't go wrong in, in such obvious ways? When we think that our belief systems are founded on, on evidence. Uh, everybody believes that what they believe is true, yeah. or they wouldn't believe it, yeah. and therefore there's some evidence, whether it's if your religion some kind of faith or some kind of proof, doesn't matter. Whatever yeah. you believe about whatever. So what can we say about the biology of the brain? I mean, you, you can't dis, you can't distinguish because there may be cases in which there's a, a very slight distortion of, mm. of the brain that you never would never become a clinical syndrome, but that affects our belief systems. Yeah, yeah. I think one thing that the brain data tell us is that for fitness-related issues, fitness being the evolutionary survival. fitness, yeah. Yeah. yeah, So matters involving those all those things we love to talk about, sex and you know, um, family stuff and money stuff, um, belief systems are going to be less uh, open to evidence than belief systems that are not tied to fitness-related mm -hmm. indicators. Mm -hmm. Those other belief systems are less hardwired in the brain, and so it's easier to bring evidence to to bear to evaluate them. How about religious uh, belief systems? Oh, that's, that's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Because um, religion, is that fitness related? Well, uh, depends on how you look at it. Depends on what you mean by religion. Mm -hmm. uh, religion, I think, certainly does involve um, hierarchies of value systems, um, but it's distant from. I mean, every religion wants to regulate and talk about sex, of course, but most religions go way beyond that and say we're talking about ultimate realities, mm -hmm. ultimate values. Mm -hmm. So you would expect religious belief systems to, to sometimes be impervious to evidence to the contrary because they, so much is up for grabs. Mm, mm. But on the other hand, it's complicated. 